Hi everyone, welcome to KubeCon session on gRPC communication patterns. I'm Kasun Indusri and my colleague Danesh Kurup will also join me in conducting this session. So in this session, we are going to have a closer look at some of the most commonly used gRPC communication pattern and we'll have a look at how they are implemented internally. I'm sure most of you have heard of gRPC or even use gRPC in production, but if you are new to gRPC, it's a modern inter-process communication technology that allows you to build distributed applications so that uh, you can design a microservices based application using gRPC and remote uh, consumers can consume it uh, over the network as easy as making a local function call. So uh, gRPC is based on a contract first uh, development approach where, uh, so that you come up with your own uh, service definition using uh, protocol buffers. So that's where you define all your business operations of, the, of your application, and then you can generate uh, server-side and client-side uh, uh, stop code so that you, uh, you can establish the communication over the gRPC channel. So uh, internally, gRPC uses uh, binary messaging using uh, protocol buffers, and uh, which runs on top of HTTP2. So gRPC is an efficient, strongly typed polyglot uh, communication protocol that allows you to build uh, request response style synchronous communication, as well as you can use uh, duplex streaming used uh, messaging in gRPC as well. So if you look at the applications of gRPC, so it is often used alongside other technologies such as uh, RESTful services, uh, GraphQL, and even technologies such as uh, uh, Kafka and Nets on the event, event communication space. So most of the internal service communication can be built using uh, gRPC, while uh, it is most commonly common to use uh, REST and GraphQL as external facing communication. Uh, however, it is also possible to expose gRPC service uh, to your consumers direct, directly uh, using an API gateway. Now let's have a closer look at the RPC flow of gRPC. So uh, here we consider the same uh, application that we discussed earlier. So here we have the product info service and the consumer application. So let's have a closer look at how uh, messaging or uh, remote method invocation works in this particular use case. So now we have the stop code generated at the client side and the server side. So from the client application, I invoke uh, the remote method. Uh, in this case, we simply invoke the stops uh, get product method using my client application code. And when you invoke that, stop is responsible for uh, converting that message, in fact, encode that message and build the uh, outgoing uh, protocol buffer message. So in this case, we create uh, message headers, two message headers. Uh, so obviously we are sending a post request to the uh, service application. And also as the path, we have the name of the service and the remote method that we invoke. And also we have things such as content type as part of the message headers. And as the message payload, we have the encoded message. So this is where we use uh, protocol buffers to encode uh, the language specific data structures into the protocol buffer via phone. Then the message is sent over the HTTP2 connection. And, uh, and at the server side, you can, uh, uh, the server application uh, looks at the path values and find the corresponding stop then uh, it is uh, sent over to the corresponding stub and stub unpacks the message and converts the message to the language specific data structures and invoke the actual implementation of the remote function. So in this case, the remote function is invoked at this, this point and then the response is sent back from the service, uh, DRPC service. So this response follows the same path as with the request. Now, if you look at uh, how these things are implemented at the HTTP2 level, so uh, suppose you have a consumer 
uh, a client application and a server application. Then uh, client creates HTTP2 connection, uh, which means it creates a, uh, in fact, it creates a gRPC channel. Uh, so on, uh, behind the scenes, it creates an uh, HTTP2 connection. So once you have the gRPC channel, you can send uh, one or more RPC requests over the same channel. So in this case, uh, these different RPCs are mapped to, RPC calls are mapped to streams in HTTP2. So here we have RPC4 and RPC3, RPC5 running on stream3 and stream4. The same applies for the response path as well. And when it comes to message uh, frames, here we are sending headers and data frames. So headers, uh, this is where all the gRPC headers are uh, sent and uh, data is the place that you send all the business specific uh, payload of the RPC request. Now, uh, let's have a closer look at request and response messages in gRPC. So if you look at the rest request message, uh, here we have the request headers. Uh, and uh, uh, a frame, a message frame known as length prefix message. So this is where you send all your business uh, payload. So this can be a single message or multiple message based on the message pattern that you're going to use. Uh, and we, we will be exploring a lot on uh, length prefix message in upcoming slides. And at the end of the request, you have to send the end of stream flag. So this is the, this is another frame, a data frame similar to the prefix message, but it's an empty frame. So that marks the end of the request in the request flow. And if you look at the response message, you have the response headers and uh, length prefix message again, same, same as the request part. And uh, to mark the end of the response uh, message, uh, we, use a, we use trailing header. So unlike uh, the request part, here we use a header frame, uh, this contains all the uh, trailing headers which mark the end of the string. Now, uh, let's try to uh, understand some of the communication patterns and uh, dive into the internal implementation uh, of each and every pattern. So let's start off with uh, unary or simple RPC. So as you know, a simple RPC is all about sending a single request to the uh, service and you expect a single response uh, from the service. So if you look at the implementation of this, so when client sends a single RPC call, it sends a set of headers, one length prefix message, and end of stream flag, an empty data frame. And in the response part, you have headers, response headers, a length prefix message, a single message, and trailing header. So this is very straightforward. Now, if you look at uh, server streaming scenario, so here we have a single request, one RPC invocation, but you get multiple responses as the, uh, multiple messages as the response. So in this case, request path is very similar to simple RPC, but in the response path, you can see we are sending headers uh, and multiple length prefix messages followed by a trailing, uh, trailing header. In the client streaming, it's the same thing, but in this case, uh, request, as, as part of the request, we are sending uh, multiple uh, request messages. Therefore, we have multiple length prefix messages followed by an end of stream. And as a response, you get a single length prefix message with headers and trailer. And if you look at uh, more complicated scenarios such as uh, bi bidirectional streaming RPC. So in this case, uh, in bidirectional RPC, we send a stream of requests and stream of responses. So you can understand this further by looking at this example. Here we are sending a series of order requests to process to be processed by the service. And once those orders are processed, a server send, service sends back a stream of shipments. So if you look at the implementation of this, again, uh, you can see there are, uh, there are multiple length prefix messages. Uh, you have header and end of stream. And in the response path, also you can see headers and multiple length prefix messages. 
And uh, when it comes to the implementation of both client and the service side, you can look, uh, you can uh, create your business logic uh, by looking at the end of stream flags uh, in both request uh, path and the response path. Now, uh, let's dive deep into request and response headers, and Danish will take you through uh, the rest of the session. Thank you, Kasun. Uh, so uh, in our previous slides, we talk about how message flow in different messaging patterns. Uh, in this section, uh, we are going to look uh, into deep into the request and response messages. First, let's look at headers. So when we talk about headers, uh, in GRPC, there are two types of headers. Uh, one is uh, called definition headers. Uh, called definition headers and the other type is custom head metadata. Call definition headers are predefined headers supported by HTTP2. If you look at the table, uh, there are a bunch of call de definition headers. Uh, some are prefixed with semicolon. So uh, those are called reserved headers. Uh, so one of those headers are one is method. So in GRPC, the HTTP method always post, and the other one is path that contains the service name and the remote method. And there are some others like authorizations and schemes as well. Uh, and the other type of headers are custom metadata. Uh, custom metadata is an arbitrary key value pairs, which is defined by the application layer. layer. So metadata, we use metadata normally to share information about gRPC call. Uh, for example, authentic authentication headers, etc. So you can see there are a couple of headers which are prefixes using gRPC hyphen. Uh, that is, uh, those headers are defined in gRPC core implementation. So uh, gRPC timeout, gRPC headquarters are such those headers. And so if you are defining custom headers, we, you need to avoid this prefix in your custom metadata. And also in the content type, uh, we, need to par we need to prefix application slash gRPC. If it is not, we'll give an error. The next thing we need to talk about is length prefix messages. Uh, by definition, message framing is an approach uh, we use to construct information such that the intended audience can easily extract that. So in gRPC, we use a message framing technique called length prefix framing. Length prefix framing is an approach we, that writes a size of the message uh, before writing the message itself. If you look at the diagram we show in right side, so you uh, we are generating the encoded byte array uh, that, uh, and we are compute the size of it and in these four bytes, we append the size of that. So in gRPC, uh, four bytes are allocated to set the size of the message and the size is written as big Indian integer. So, and also you can see one byte in front of that uh, size, four bytes, that represent the compression flag. So if it is zero, that means this message is not compressed. If it is one, that means this message is compressed. The compression uh, algorithm is defined, uh, defined and passed in the uh, request, message, request headers. So, the other thing I need we need to talk about is that how we how gRPC encode binary message. By default, gRPC uses protocol buffers to encode this message. So the protocol buffer encodes the message based on the structures defined in this uh, service contract. So if you look at the look at the definition, so you can see. Uh, you can see a proto protocol definition. So in our example, we have order ID message and it has one field called ID. And from that message, uh, we are, they are 
generating the binary uh, message binary. So if you extract the binary, you can see there are different tag values, uh, tag value pairs. So in our case, we have one order message with one field. That means uh, we have only one tag value pair. So the tag value pair is mapped to a message field. So at the end of the message, we pass zero to indicate that it's the end of the message. So uh, when we go in deep to the tag and value pair, so the tag is derived using uh, field index, which is defined in the service contract and the wire type. The wire type is directly mapped to the field type. So in our case, uh, it is a string type that uh, the string like map to uh, length lim delimited that means the wire type uh, value is two so in from that we derive the tag value and uh, the value of the field is encoded using different technique based on the wire type uh, in this case it is string that means we are using uh, utf8 encoding uh, to encode the value if it is an integer, we may use point, uh, depending on the type. Uh, the, the next major thing we need to talk about when it comes to gRPC is error handling. So errors are a first class concept in gRPC. That means every RPC call, uh, the response will be either a payload message or an error. The error includes a status code which is predefined and it is unified across all languages and also we uh, they pass us a status message which describe the error and also these errors are sent as a response trailing headers so i capture uh, in the first table we i capture those two headers comes in the trailing as trailing headers one is the rpc status Another one is gRPC message. In GR, uh, so let's say uh, the request computed successfully. In that case, the gRPC status will be zero. That means okay. Uh, if it is an error popped up uh, in the uh, service side, uh, um, the corresponding error is uh, going as the gRPC status and gRPC message describe what the error this is. So when it comes to error handling, uh, there are a couple of uh, best, best practices we follow. Uh, the first one is we do not include error details in the response payload in most cases. Uh, so uh, that means all the error details are always going through the training headers. There are some of situation we cannot follow this. Uh, let's say you are using a streaming example and you you need to pass an error detail to the client without uh, without stopping the stream. In that case, you need to uh, uh, add error details in the response payload. Otherwise, most of the cases you can uh, send the errors by uh, the training headers. Uh, the other thing is at server side when we are when we have an error, uh, it's better we can return all the errors to the client. A caller. So unless there's an internal state of compromise, uh, in other cases we can send it to the call. Most of the cases. Uh, the other thing I need to uh, have emphasize is the deadline. Deadline allows both client and services to know when to abort the operations. The clients are the one who initialize the call. Uh, that uh, so once the initial role initialize client is setting the deadlines so deadlines uh, is normally set as absolute time which specify the time which we abort the operations so when when the client in initialize the call uh, the deadline uh, information also go inside uh, inside the call inside the request message as the header and when it when in come to the service they first look at uh, what is the deadline param uh, that uh, uh, according to the deadline param they decide whether to proceed the operation or abort it and send an error to the client 
So if the service calling another service, it's bad. It's it's important to propagate those deadline information to the other services as well. The interceptors are also a main point in uh, GR, GRPC applications. The mechanism is to execute some common logic before and after the execution uh, of the remote function. Uh, we can apply it both to the server and client side. And depending on the message pattern we use, we need to use uh, different interceptors like unary interceptors, uh, streaming interceptors, etc. The useful, uh, the main use of these interceptors are uh, for the login uh, scenarios and the authentication scenarios, or we need to capture some metrics. For those use cases, we, we use interceptors. Uh, when it comes to the, when it comes implementing services, uh, the service versioning also plays an important role. So let's say you have a service running and you need to uh, update the service. So the, servi uh, the services should strive to remain backward compatible with the old client. So if we have a better versioning strategy that will allow us to introduce breaking changes to the GRPC service. So in GRPC, all these serv service versionings uh, done using the package name. So we are appending the version number to the package name. How it works is, uh, uh, as we told earlier, uh, GRPC call is underneath a post request. And the part of the uh, part of the request is derived using the package name, service name, and the method name. So if you append the version to the package name, that means whenever the version number change, that that will create a different uh, context. So the old client will not affect when we deploy both services in this in the environment. So that if the client uh, needs to uh, uh, migrate to the new version, uh, they need to uh, get the correct version of the proto definition and generate the stuff of it. The final thing we need to discuss in this session is to extending service definition. Let's say uh, there can be situation where we generate uh, a dif a dif application with different messaging patterns. You need to extend your service definitions and add some uh, custom options. In protocol buffer definition, uh, they, they provide us this facility to add custom options in different levels of uh, contract. So it can be service level, it can be method level, it can be fee levels, etc. So, uh, so I captured a few of these uh, scenarios. We may use it. So if you talk about one uh, scenario, so let's say we have a service and it's secured using uh, external or provider. So you need to pass this or provide the URL in the service contract itself. There you can uh, define the service options to provide the string or provide the URL and we can use that uh, of, uh, custom options in that inside our service definition. Uh, same, uh, likewise, you can uh, uh, add custom options inside a method level and also in the field level as well. Okay, uh, that's it uh, we need to cover in this session. So um, in this session, we mainly refer to the GRPC up and running book and all the use cases and the source codes are in this GitHub repo. So uh, that's we need to cover. So thank you for listening.